Washoe County Library System welcomes you to our monthly series from the Nevada Historical Society, presenting High Noon with Neil Cobb. This afternoon's topic is Nevada's Times and Rhymes with Jerry Aaron. My name is Mela, and I'm so happy to be with you here today. And now I would like to introduce Sherry Hayden Sorn with the Nevada Historical Society. Again, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you so much. And as always, we love working with the Washoe County Library Systems and, and, and they're right. It's, we, this has been a long-term in-person event, but um, we've been able to present it to everyone by virtual uh, lectures and we love it. So I'm Sherry and I'm the Curator of Manuscripts here at the Nevada Historic Society. And we so appreciate you joining us today or one of our followers and, and have seen many of our programs over, over the years. So uh, I wanna introduce our host, um, Neil Cobb, a longtime historian and our honorary uh, curator. And he's, he's, he's a wonderful historian, has a great uh, resource that he shares and we care for his photography's uh, collection, Modern Photo, um, that his family uh, ran. And it's, it's a great resource. So if you're always looking for Reno photos, come and check us out. And, and Neil's Cobb, uh, his collection is an important one that um, people are always looking at. So without further ado, let me introduce Neil Cobb. Hey, Neil. Sherry, thank you so much. I want to introduce our speaker today, who is a longtime friend of mine. I've met him at Westerners. And if you don't know anything about Westerners, uh, look that up or Google it. It's a fine organization and you can learn a lot. But Jerry has been our program a couple of times there uh, over different books that he's written. Now, his first book it was <laughs> Diesel, Smoke, and Asphalt Ribbons. And the reason for that is he was a long time, his, almost his entire life after he got a license as a long line driver, short time driver, whatever it had to do with the trucking industry itself. He'd worked himself all the way up to management. And he is a very, very experienced and knowledgeable man when it comes to that. And this is a good book to look up to that uh, Diesel Smoke and Asphalt Ribbons. It's a, it's a dandy, great photos in the thing too. But then he's, he's done all kinds of other things. Uh, number one, uh, he was instrumental in starting a local car club, uh, Obsolete Iron. And uh, the, uh, the Reno Autorama, uh, he was the chairman of that for over 18 years. So he's well versed with anything that has an engine. So away we go with that. He is a number one owner of a red Jeep that is put more miles off road than on road. He has discovered all of these different places on his own. He loves Nevada. He wanted to know more about it. And he's taken all kinds of great photos. And he's going to be able to tell you about this and where he's been and why he started <laughs> to be an author. Who in the world would want to be an author? Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, when you have something that's worth saying, it's better to get it in print so you, somebody else can read it after you're no longer here. So I want to welcome our speaker today, Mr. Jerry Aaron. Thank you, Neil. I appreciate it. That was a very nice introduction. Well, folks, I hope that uh, I'll entertain you and teach you a little bit about Nevada, maybe a few things that you don't know. Uh, this is my adopted state. I came from uh, the Golden State, but uh, actually, I think the Silver State is uh, my home and has been for 60 years or so now. And as a young man, I, I started kind of getting out in the desert and, and looking around, and uh, it just fascinates me. It takes a certain part of a uh, person to enjoy Nevada. <laughs> a lot of people say, well, it's ugly. 
Well, I'll give you that. There's a couple of places that I don't know that I'd go back again, but uh, that's okay. There's plenty of places I haven't been, and that's where I want to go now. And uh, uh, history has always kind of fascinated me. I have a lot of respect for all of the people, especially the hardworking people that helped build our country, uh, as well as Nevada and, and all around the world, actually. Just the regular folks. I am not too much into the political part and all of those kind of people. I want the working people. The, today, the kids that are at McDonald's or wherever, if they give you good service, I want to say a hey, good job. Uh, and that's what I want to do with what I've written as far as the history of Nevada. The people that struggled to, to uh, settle the state, cross the state as the West was being settled. Uh, the, the Great Basin, of course, is where Nevada is uh, located. I guess most of us probably that live here understand that. I've written a book previously to this one that was called The Chronicle of Nevada's Great Basin. Uh, it deals a lot about many, many things in Nevada, from the military, the rivers, and that, all that sort of things. I and mean, it was directed just to general public or whatever. People that have moved to Nevada recently or whatever, I feel they should know something about their state, whether they go out and, and travel the back roads or, or just take Interstate 80 and drive over maybe to Elko or whatever. I think they need to know the lay of the land as far as if this is going to become their home, their home state, uh, as it has become mine. And I, I just love this state and the people that are in it that help build it. Well, after this book, I have some neighbors at home school. And uh, anyway, I thought, well, it's kind of fun. I like to make things rhyme. I'm not a poet. I don't claim to be. I don't claim to be a great writer. I just have maybe a little knack to make things rhyme. So as they were learning a little bit about Nevada, I kind of wrote up some rhymes dealing with the history of Nevada. And I ran those poems by the kids. And uh, they said, well, hey, those are kind of fun. It's, it, you know, it was an easy and fun way to learn about Nevada. And then uh, one day they said, well, if you had some pictures. And I thought, well. <laughs> I'm a guy that's got a lot of pictures. I've been taking pictures in Nevada for 50 plus years, uh, just for my own records or whatever. Remember where I've been and, and what I've done. So that's how uh, Nevada's Times and Rhymes came about. I wanted the kids to, to know about Nevada. Uh, their mother was raised in Truckee and, uh, and uh, of course, after Mary's, they moved to, uh, to Nevada, which is, you know, what, 30 miles. Anyway, so uh, she knew very little about Nevada. And I thought, my goodness sake, she lived in Truckee. Uh, you know, maybe you ventured over once in a while, but some people are not very adventuresome. Uh, and that's a shame because there's people that I've talked to and met here in Nevada. And one of my most favorite things that I can remember about Nevada as being young is that short ride out to Pyramid Lake for the first time. When you go over that little ridge after, you know, 25 miles of barren land, pretty much, uh, I mean, beautiful mountains, the colors and everything, because that's Nevada. And you, you climb that little ridge and yet highway takes you over and all of a sudden, there it is. There in the middle of a dry desert, the Great Basin, what's left of it is Pyramid Lake. It, it's just a wonderful feeling. I don't know, it's like, wow, really? And that sticks in my mind even today, although that's been 60 years ago. I still get that feeling when I, when I go out to Pyramid Lake. Uh, and so I wanna share that type of feeling with people uh, that are new to Nevada. And it's amazing how many people have never been to Pyramid Lake. And I'll say, why? Goodness sakes. It's a nice little Sunday drive or whatever. You just go out there and turn around and come back. Take a couple hours. Anyway, that's how I feel about Nevada. Everything out there is worth looking for. And that's what I still do. Uh, early on, as I drove truck, I would uh, you know, travel many of the roads in Nevada, the highways. 
and I would see all of these roads going up into canyons, which mostly were because the miners had, you know, had a little camp up there or whatever. But I couldn't take the truck up there. And I thought, I gotta, I gotta see what's up that canyon. <laughs> Sometimes there's nothing. You'll find a road that's got, wow, this looks like a lot of people go up here. Well, yeah, because it only goes a mile and you have to turn around and come back. So it gets double the traffic. But then there's those roads that lead up into a canyon and you find a, a spring and aspens and maybe some old cabins and all that stuff. And it, that, that to me is Nevada. And maybe you'll find some people out there that to share that with. But uh, anyway, that's my love of Nevada. And I hope I'll share some of it with you today and stir your interest. And uh, we'll move on to, uh, let's see if I can make this work now. There it is. Okay. This book, as you can tell, there's a little explosion there on the right-hand side. Uh, for many of you, you may not know, but there was a lot of uh, above ground bomb testing in Nevada uh, in, during the Cold War. And uh, that's why that is there. And that is on the Black Rock Desert, although that's not where that happened. That's, that's Photoshop, they call it. But anyway, let's move along. In my, uh, in my book of rhymes, uh, as you can see there, the chapters uh, until uh, Great Basin and of course facts about Nevada, the rivers, the towns, the railroads, mining, wildlife, military, roads and highways. And each chapter as it begins has another map uh, similar to the cover map, but different time frame. okay? So a person, as they go into a chapter, they can kind of look at that map and see where Nevada has uh, changed over the years. Well, I'm gonna read this poem. Now, I'm not a very good poem reader, but uh, I'm gonna give it a shot here. So we'll start off with this one. Of course, you need to know that Nevada had uh, a number of names and uh, here we go. The state of Nevada has three nicknames. The most popular is what brought it fame. Because of the Comstock Lodes Silver Strike, the name Silver State mining people liked. Nevada became a state during uh, America's Civil War. President Lincoln needed the state's vote in 1844. To help end the warring between America's North and South, entering the United States is 36th in the country's amount. Brought into statehood during the war to end slavery. Battleborn for helping black people to become free. Also known as the sagebrush state for the plant that grows all, all across most of Nevada, it's gray green, bluish color will show. Okay, now let's learn a little bit about the Great Basin. Okay, it's bordered as you can see in the picture here on the west by California, Oregon, and Idaho to the north, and Utah to the east. Uh, a good portion is in, as you can see, Utah, but the majority of the Great Basin is Nevada. And it falls a little short of Las Vegas, uh, which is okay by me. Anyway, uh, uh, Las Vegas is in the Mojave Desert, but uh, it's called a basin and that was uh, found mainly by uh, Fremont and his explorations. Uh, as most all the rivers run into the basin, no rivers in Nevada go directly to the ocean like the rest of the world or the country. Uh, there's a few in the northwestern part of the state that uh, do flow into the Snake River Plain and into the Snake River, which in turn uh, goes into the Columbia and then to the ocean. Okay, so now you got the lay of the land, and we're going to go another thing here and see what happens. Early on, you know, Nevada history goes back to prehistoric history, actually, uh, prehistoric times you know, 15, 10, 15,000 years ago. This is the mouth of what they call Fish Cave. It says east of Fallon. Now where the car is in the picture, probably, well not probably, at one time was the ocean. The great uh, Lake Lahontan, okay, or ancient Lake Lahontan, whatever you prefer. 
but from the, the mouth of this cave today in the far distance, if you can see, there's kind of a tree line over here. That's Fallon. Fallon's are actually a little bit more back this way, but anyhow, at one time when the prehistoric people here, this would have been uh, uh, oceanfront property, I guess you'd call it. Uh, as they lived off of the, the tules and, and the bird life or whatever, the fish, however they survived, had to be something that you have to come up with in your imagination. And imagination is a, is a vital part to being in Nevada. And looking back at history, you have to visualize in your mind how these people struggled to cross Nevada. These uh, chippings are here, probably petroglyphs and, and uh, pictographs, date back to 15,000, 10, 15,000 years old in Nevada. These are up in the northern part of Nevada. And this picture was taken by my good friend, uh, Jerry Fenwick. I have not actually seen this. But with a little imagination, you can kind of picture a face. Of course, a prehistoric man, I don't know that he would have probably looked at it that way. But uh, uh, with a lichen and stuff growing on a rock, it's actually a very colorful and interesting picture. But that would have been all chipped in with, uh, I guess, by hand. And then again, all throughout Nevada, you can find the, the uh, pictographs and, and, and petroglyphs. Uh, Surprisingly, this one is down by Hawthorne, south of Hawthorne in a canyon uh, that was just being driven up to kind of see what was up there. And nobody today, modern scientists or whatever you want to call them, historians can figure out exactly what any of this stuff is. So when you find a rock, especially one like this, it's got quite a bit of chippings on it. It's uh, it's kind of amazing. You can read it however you want. I don't know. This could be uh, Maybe a snake, uh, who knows, maybe this was the snake. Maybe, and this was a man up here or a stick figure. But it's just kind of fun to look at it and see if you can cipher out what it might have been, what they meant when they did all of this, because it, it took a little bit of time to do this, probably a couple hundred years. But it's still there as vivid as it was probably when it was made, because there's a, like a varnish that's on the rocks. And if you chip, you, uh, you know, naturally chip it down to the bare rock again. And uh, as I say, they're all over the state. And uh, it, you can find them anywhere, everywhere. But it's quite interesting, is, at least to me. And that's an, usually a surprise if you're going up some canyon somewhere to see this. And the earlier uh, explorers into the Great Basin, the hardships they faced were unbelievable. Uh, Ogden uh, didn't spend all of that much time in the basin. John C. Fremont, people like uh, Smith and, and those type of people uh, actually explored it. If you can imagine coming into this valley, some came from California, skirted around the northern part uh, through Oregon and then dropping into California and then came back through Nevada. And uh, just how gutsy those people had to be, those men, to strike out. Maybe there'd be a group of two or three or 20 or 30, but not knowing anything about what they would see in the next half a mile. I mean, would there be a spring out there? You don't know. Sometimes uh, Native Americans, uh, the Indians would uh, be able to help them by showing them a uh, spring and then sometimes for days and days they would just have to survive the best that they could many came probably many starved to death actually uh the famous ones that we hear of today uh fortunately they did survive and early on the earliest one like the trappers when they came into nevada they didn't really record anything they were trapping beaver and stuff but it wasn't all that fruitful in nevada uh, early on, that was more of, uh, you know, Idaho and, and north, uh, east of Nevada, as far as the, the large beaver and that stuff. So, so the frontiersmen did come into Nevada, but they didn't record much because most of them probably couldn't read or write. But you can associate the names of these people with 
different place, especially Fremont. Fremont, his name is, is known throughout the West, uh, Nevada and California both, because he was, you know, the main explorer, I guess, of all. But it's fun to, to go out into different areas and associate names that you've heard with the area that you're in. Even in town, if you see the name of a street or whatever, you, you wonder, or I wonder anyway, well, who was that guy? Kleppy Lane, Kitsky Lane in Reno, those were ranchers and farmers and that sort of stuff that uh, the streets were named after. And that to me is very interesting and, and how hard those people probably worked. But Fremont was actually the one as far as the white man to discover Pyramid Lake and name Pyramid Lake. He had been, and this was in the wintertime. And if you've ever been out around that area in the wintertime, like December, it can be uh, uncomfortable, I'll put it that way. They were, they were camped at the hot springs at, at what is now Gerlach on the Black Rock Desert. And they spent some time up there, him and his, his group. And they were not in very good shape food-wise. They came in from this direction here. And if you can make it out, this is the pyramid here. So they skirted along the edge of the lake, but I'm sure the lake was much, much higher in those days. And when this was the lake, Great Lake, lake Lahontan, these were most likely have been just islands, similar to Anahoe Island, where is the Pelican's sanctuary. So these would have probably been uh, kind of islands or whatever during the Great Lake. But when Fremont came through it, of course, it had receded quite a bit or almost completely. Anyhow, he circled along here and then he met up with the uh, some Paiute people and they more or less saved the day for him and his, and his men. But this is uh, obviously why he called it the Pyramid Lake. He thought it looked like the pyramids in Egypt and I agreed with him. I still agree with him. Why wouldn't I? Then next came the wagon trains and they came in from the east along the Humboldt River. If you're familiar with the Humboldt River, it runs from Wells to uh, Elko, Battle Mountain, and westward into uh, Winnemucca. And then it goes into the uh, Humboldt Sink. And uh, the wagon trains use that river because that's basically all they had to really work with. So they followed the river west and this is at the Interpretive Center in, uh, at Elko. It's a, a likeness of uh, what a, they felt would be a, a campsite for the night for the uh, pioneers. But as I've looked at this, I realized that, of course, they don't have a lot of old buckets. They got new buckets and then they got <laughs> barrels. Now, this would have been more the size, I would believe, of a water barrel because they had to carry their own water. Well, I had to carry everything. And this is very huge. I don't know how you would, until it was empty, load it and unload it into your wagon. Uh, but they did the best they could. The Interpretive Center is a very interesting place, museum to go visit and explains the hardships that the uh, wagon trains face or the, or the pioneers face coming across to the West. Uh, by the time they got to Nevada, they were already pretty whooped, a lot of them, especially the Donner Party, and most of us know that story. Uh, that, wasn't a, that wasn't a good part of the West. But um, anyhow, the size of the wagons and all are pretty accurate, but I think they got a lot of extra furniture here that those people probably didn't really unload or have, not at least when they got into Nevada. In parts of Nevada, they begin to throw their belongings away just to survive. And as far as camping, this is a Humboldt River today. And it's like many of the rivers in Nevada. Uh, if you're from back east, this isn't really much of a river. But if you were a pioneer and this is the only place you could get water, I guess it was a pretty good river. I would imagine in those days as well, there was probably a lot more flow of water. But if you could imagine camping in an area where the, the mud was, when you stepped in it, probably a foot deep, if you could get down the banks to get water, you had to get water for your cattle, for your horses, for your people. 
that was a hardship in itself. Can you imagine having to go down there and drag up buckets of water? Because you had to have plenty of water if you had to have water for your animals and your people. And I just, I don't know. I think we're kind of spoiled today because I have a faucet in my house. I just turn it on and water runs out. It's amazing, amazing where we're at today. But anyway, this is the famous, what I feel probably was the most famous river, at least for the Western migration uh, of that time. And this is what happens when they got to uh, a 40 mile desert. This is a photograph from a gentleman. Um, this was probably in the late fifties. And when they got to this area, they were already pretty well spent. In the Lovelock area, they would lay over, water up, feed the cattle as best they could and, and, and store up whatever water they could carry and strike out across the 40 mile, mile desert. If you're not familiar with the area that is east of Fernley, north of uh, Fallon and uh, well, Trinity Junction would be north of, uh, of Fallon, 40 miles or so. Very dry, and as you can see, these would be uh, barrel hoops from uh, water. Uh, barrels that they threw after they were empty throughout. This would be bones of the cattle. Uh, the later trains faced more hardships because they had less uh, feed for the cattle in the different places that they would stop. Uh, like rye patch, there was rye grain that, that they had at rye patch. But if you were late in the season, that was pretty well used up by the previous trains, which would be as many as 10 wagons, 40 wagons, however. But I can remember a time in the 1960s where you could still find hoops and pieces out there, uh, maybe even some bones, but I'm sure over the time there was bones of people as well. Because a lot of people lost their lives on that stretch between Trinity Junction and Fallon. And people from back east, they've never, they didn't see rivers just disappear like they do in Nevada. As the Carson River comes in, it comes in uh, and then it sinks as well into the Carson sink. Now for people that wanna be a little bit adventuresome, this is right here in our Truckee Meadows. This is uh, above Hidden Valley. This would be the backside or the east side of Rattlesnake Mountain, kind of there's a gravel pit up there. Today we have Veterans Parkway is over in here. The highway runs the new road through here. If you're, a, well, through here actually, not up on this hill. This comes down, this is part of the original trail. This comes down and makes a loop to the right and then goes into the Truckee Meadows. And the trail would have continued west to pass the convention center and up by the Washoe Golf Course and on further out towards Verdi, which you can go up and you can walk along this path today. Now you can see that this wasn't graded. This was over years and, and thousands of people that passed by would throw the rocks out as they went along or kick them off to the side to try and make some kind of a trail. Okay, so that's how that appears today. So you can go up through Hidden Valley and uh, I don't know, they've changed the gate over, over here. Here's where the highway is. But you'd have to come over Rattlesnake Mountain. This is the Carson River, which is the Carson course flows towards Fallon. This is Table Mountain. This is a beautiful little, little canyon through here. And it goes over to Lake Lahontan, the reservoir, which is behind Lahontan Dam. This was part of the Newlands project uh, in 1910 or so, uh, when they wanted to develop the land around the area of Fallon for farming. And uh, of course, they needed irrigation. So the dam was built. And uh, the Newlands project didn't get off to a very good start. They would give you a certain amount of land uh, for little or, uh, or nothing. You just made some kind of payments on it. I can't tell you that exactly. I don't remember now. But anyway, you get five acres or 10 acres. But the soil was not good enough to start just throwing down some seeds and things grew. It took a number of years before Fallon really kind of developed and uh, 
now one of the major crops in that area is uh, alfalfa. And of course, they did have a, a cantaloupes were very popular at one time, and that were very good. The golden, golden something. I forget Hearts what they gold. Hearts of gold. That's it. Okay, this is the uh, Rye Patch Dam. I was just out there last Sunday, and there's not enough water to make that even concrete slab there moist. <laughs> the dam is about to grow, uh, dried up, is what I was trying to say. And uh, that is a shame because we are in a drought at this time, as many people uh, will know. Uh, Okay, here is another uh, interesting kind of thing in Nevada. This is Walker Lake. And Walker Lake also is drying up. Walker Lake is also part, one of the, well, there's Pyramid and Walker Lakes are the only lakes that are left from the great ancient Lake Powhatan, okay? And as irrigation water in, in Reno has taken water from the Truckee and the, the lakes are, are drying up, not so much with Pyramid any, anymore, but Walker Lake is suffering. At one time, this was used for commercial fishing, this boat. It's a very large boat. Looks like it was very heavy. And they fished that lake and then, you know, naturally sold a fish. If you're on the back side of the lake, which would be the east side, uh, you can drive to this. Uh, and and I guess see it, it it's kind of neat to me but then I'm a history buff so if you're not a history buff probably doesn't mean much but anyhow uh, it's on the back side you can go in the highway run now today runs along this, this side and you can go into uh, the base of the ammunition depot and cut through there and come back on the back side of the lake and if you look between the lake and the road the dirt road you can see the boat but you can see how much the, the lake has receded this was probably in the 1950s i would guess somewhere in their late 40s the 1950s so i don't know if this the the water was here at that time they blocked it up in hopes i'm sure of coming back and and i i don't know starting or their canning or whatever there's evidence that there was some kind of a facility to process the fish that they caught uh, uh, kind of little dikes and stuff that evidently they had water in I, I don't know it's just another I call them mysteries of Nevada and then of course now also in the, the poem book it deals with the uh, the railroads we had many railroads in Nevada at one time as we did towns uh, this is a picture of the uh, Inyo at the sheds over in Carson at the, at the barns. These, these were right about the corner of uh, Highway 50 uh, in uh, Carson. And uh, they were beautiful old stone building that you can see that the trains, they did the repairs and stuff in there. And a few years ago, I don't know, some people decided that uh, I guess it was an eyesore or whatever. But then there was people like myself that had hopes that they would develop and do some kind of a, maybe a mall or whatever. Well, the people that wanted to tear it down, they, uh, they won out. And then I guess they were gonna build something there. But that's probably been uh, close to 30 years ago. And so far what they developed there is a patch of weeds. It's just a, still a vacant, piece of property and it was so sad to see that part of history destroyed and in the meantime though they now have the, the railroad completed back up to uh, Virginia City but it goes from Mound House up but they lost a, a great part of history there I, I feel that that was not a not a good idea to tear that down but it's all about money all right here we go back to the kind of the uh, 40 mile desert uh, the book deals with, uh, you know, uh, highways and stuff in Nevada. And uh, if you can imagine yourself, this is where your curiosity and your imagination comes in when you go out to and venture out in Nevada, maybe to, to explore a little bit. 
Can you imagine this man here? He had no cell phone. He had no 7-Elevens. He had nothing. And most likely he had, had enough water for his animals and himself, hopefully, and carried his tobacco and whiskey or whatever. And that's what fueled them, the people. And a lot of times they walked. Many times in the wagon trains, the people walked because just human weight added to a wagon would uh, tire the animals, oxen and horses or mules. So people walked, they didn't need that extra weight in the wagons. But I'm sure that this, by the looks of it, was a hot summer day or whatever. And who knows where, you can see what he, where he was headed. It looks probably much like this in front of him as well. Uh, I don't know, they were very, very tough people. That's why I have so much respect for these people. And, and I want other, other people to, understand the hardships that these people went through to make what we have today. I don't want you to live in the past, but you sure ought to know a little bit about it and the hardships they faced. We're so spoiled today, I could not survive out there. Okay, this is, uh, this is in the museum, the Humboldt Museum in Winnemucca. It's a 1903 Oldsmobile. It was donated uh, to the museum, <laughs> but it, I feel this was in Lovelock. I feel that this is possibly the first car in the state of Nevada in 1903. Okay, there was a gentleman named Lud Marker who was uh, had a mercantile store, I think, and he was probably a, a, a bit of a, a what do I want to say? Blacksmith. There it is. Anyway, Mr. Marker, he thought he ought to have a car. So he orders the Oldsmobile. Okay, and a little bit of a story goes with this. So the car was sent out by railroad and arrived in Lovelock. Now, this is where your imagination comes in. There was a few cars. Well, there was hardly any cars in Nevada at that time. Of course, the Goldfield and Tonopah booms had cars, but they were usually about 1905, six, seven in there before the cars started to really appear, you know, where the money was, which was in Goldfield and uh, Tonopah. Anyway, I can imagine that the whole town probably showed up because I imagine the word got out that here, a car is gonna be delivered in Lovelock, Nevada in 1903. So you can imagine the crowd gathered around this, the station and they unloaded the car. Probably two guys could pick it up and set it on the ground. It only weighs a few hundred pounds. Well, maybe three or four guys. So they unload the car and the crowd's all there. And Bud comes up to his new car and look at that boy, shiny, pretty and everything. And it won't start. Well, why won't it start? I guess there's some kind of directions, who knows? Anyway, he tries and tries and tries. And you can imagine the crowd is by now beginning to think, well, this, this, these cars are not all they're cracked up to be. So, Blood goes home, gets his horse, hooks it to the car, takes the car home. Embarrassed, I'm sure I would be. Anyway, so, uh, Blood gets a hold of the Oldsmobile people and says, hey, I got this car and now I won't run. And they said, well, did you put the spark plug in it? Well, where's the spark plug? Well, the spark plug's under the seat. You have to put it in the engine. Well, by golly, that worked. <laughs> so after I'm sure an embarrassing day with a whole town, which probably at that time was 100 people, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure he was quite embarrassed, but the car was saved. And if you're in Winnemucca, there is a wonderful, wonderful museum there. And uh, go see the car and, and uh, use your imagination to see what uh, you think Ludd would have felt that day and the embarrassment of his brand new, probably the first car in Nevada and it wouldn't run.
And then as, as, as the highways progressed over the years from the wagon roads and trails was developed, the Lincoln Highway was uh, our first intercontinental highway, I guess, if you would call it that. Uh, and it was named after President Lincoln. And it was kind of went through towns here and there all across the country. And then uh, it was the first really marked road where uh, people at that time in the teens and uh, late teens and early twenties, okay, could, could take their cars and go a distance and know where they were at. They put up, they put up these signs, these were porcelain signs. I think they put them up as targets, evidently. That's what they wound up being anyway. And these are bridge markers. It was only two or threes across the whole country that were set up uh, as railings like that with the Lincoln Highway. These were saved when the freeway went through uh, uh, Reno. They are now located at the Vista Point at Mogul. And if you want to take a little drive out there, you can. This is uh, uh, part of the old uh, highway out the other side of Middlegate. You can still drive on the highway and uh, go all the way over to uh, almost to Austin on it. It's still a good road, but the main highway is over New Pass now. Okay. And this is uh, up Eagle Canyon. Uh, out of uh, Carson City, goes up to the top of Spooner Summit. If you've got a high, uh, what I wanna say, high, high vehicle, you can drive this road without any problem, pickup truck or, or whatever. Anyway, you can see where they hand stack the stones and stuff to build a retaining wall for the highway. And uh, they did that in many, many places along that way. All of that work was done by hand. Today, Okay, modern times. This is in the Truckee Canyon, just the other side of our new USA Parkway on the east side. This, the route of the river used to go this way here and then back around the mountain. When the freeway was put in, they cut the edge of this hill, routed the railroad closer to the river. So you got the Truckee River. If the railroad, you got Interstate 80. This is old highway. 40, and this may have been the Lincoln Highway. I can't say that for sure, but this runs over now by Red Cliff. But in the old days, the river ran this way and went out through these trees, and the old highway went this way or went that went around by Red Cliffs and then back out this way. So this is one of the few places that you can see the river, and this little fine line was probably the California Trail. Yeah, I've walked over there and it, it was used probably by wagons evidently. So I would think that that would be the, the river, the California Trail, the, the railroad today, partly where the, maybe the Central Pacific went through. Interstate 80, Highway 40, and probably a Lincoln Highway, or this may have been a Central Pacific's route too. I don't know. But anyway, it was built by man. Okay. Okay, it also deals with the wildlife of Nevada, bighorn sheep, the tortoises, the kangaroo rats, those are cute little luggers. And the horned toads, of course, we have other things besides uh, that antelope, deer. You need to get out there. You don't always have to have a Jeep, okay? I have a Jeep because I think they're fun. Anyway, there's a lot of times that there's something up on the side of a mountain that you want to go, and I'm getting too old to walk. So that Jeep takes me kind of where I want to go or close enough that I can walk. Uh, and this was out in uh, Crescent Valley at, uh, I can't even think of the name of the town now, but anyway, there was a number of cabins and stuff there, but you can tell by the roads that you can go out with an everyday car, just be cautious, use common sense. And if the, your phone tells you you can go out there, or your computer, GPS, whatever, I don't use that, I can still fold a map. Anyway, don't let it confuse you. If it doesn't look right, don't go, okay? Turn around if you don't think your car will make it. This was a little little town called Poinsettia. It wasn't a town, it was a camp. And I discovered this by accident one day. There's a ridge like this that goes all the way around and it sets in a basin. And when I went over the edge of that ridge and looked at that, I thought, oh, wow, what a cool place. And uh, I'm not gonna tell you where it's at, okay? 
This is uh, Rio Teno, it's north of Elko. This was a copper mining company town. There's, uh, it's posted no trespassing, but I, I, I don't have a picture of that sign. Anyway, there's an abandoned gig, abandoned school and stuff there. It's kind of an interesting location. But if you do go to these places, don't destroy anything. Leave it for other people to see. I've gone to so many places in, in the last 40, 50 years and gone back and they've been destroyed. Some by mother nature, and that's gonna be a natural part of the uh, of evolving into where we're at today. But a lot of it is done by people that just shouldn't be out in our Nevada. People that don't care about it. This is something else too. You'll find a lot of mines, tunnels, shafts, all throughout Nevada. At one time they were gonna cover them and close them and fence them off. As you can see this at one time had a steel door, okay, to block the entrance. Well, when there's nobody around, people do what they do. And they evidently broke into this one here. As you can see, I didn't go very far in there. Sometimes you might wanna venture in, but just be careful, use your common sense. If you see a lot of stuff laying in the way, it could be even worse inside or worse once you get inside. Today, they don't use the tunnels and the shafts so much. Most of it is open pit mining. Okay, this is a mine out by Eureka, Nevada. I don't think it's an operation anymore. It has a pit. It's not one of the large mines. You get into the Carlin trend and you got Barrick and Newmont. Those are huge pits. You can go onto your Google map and fly over them and see how large they are. It's, it's amazing, amazing. But this was a gold mine. And, uh, and uh, I think it was a Newmont mine, or I may be wrong on that. And then you had the early airplanes. This was in Sparks in uh, 1916. Okay, this is kind of a fun picture as I don't know what the deal is with the pilot, okay? But you got guys holding an airplane here, okay? I guess he's winding it up. The dog wants to know what's this going on here? So I guess as soon as you got your propeller going fast enough, the guys let go of the plane. Uh, well, guess that's how that worked. But you can see there's not much of a runway. They just landed in dirt fields. I believe this was over kind of off of Kleppy Lane where the school bus yard is. I, I'm guessing it was in that area over there because that was fairly flat in those days. Okay, in fact, there was later an airport there uh, where the school bus yard is. And then there also was an airport on Greenbrae where the shopping center is there, okay? There was an airport there. Okay, in the early days of the mail carrying by air in the 1920s or so, they built arrows out of concrete to direct the pilots because they, they only flew about 80, 90 miles an hour and didn't fly very high off the ground, but their instruments weren't much. I guess they had a a compass, but they probably didn't work very well. So anyway, the government came up with a system of arrows, concrete arrows, and they would fly over the arrow and it would point them in the direction to go. This one, I think, is a Golconda. Yeah, this is a Golconda arrow. And uh, later on, it, they, they couldn't go at night because uh, they couldn't see the arrows. So they thought, well, then we'll build uh, uh, towers, beacons, Okay, and they built a number of beacons all across America, not just here, but this one is out by Fernley. Okay, still standing today, and they were uh, they had an acetylene uh, light. Uh, that's what fired the light was acetylene. So they would have to change out those tanks every so often. These are located in pretty much remote areas, but if you're going towards Fernley from Reno, if you're going east, if you look up on the hill, just just before you get to the river at Wadsworth, you'll see this tower up on the, the top. But what was unusual, what brought this about is they tried an experiment by the planes would load the uh, mail and they would fly until almost dark and they would land near the railroad. They would put the mail on the train. Train would go through the night then it would, wherever daylight came, I guess the plane would be there, put it back on the plane, fly it till it got dark again, and it hopscotched across the country. That worked only for a few months, but I thought that was kind of interesting that they would go through all that trouble. The Pony Express almost did that good, which is uh, another part of Nevada. 
This is a B-29 that was on its dead a number of years back during the air races. But in, in the poems and as well as the book, it covers uh, the military bases, the importance that they were in, uh, in, in Nevada, how much important Nevada was. A B-29 was the called the Enola Gay was at the Wendover uh, base, which is not in Nevada, but it's on the Nevada border at Wendover. You got East and West Wendover. And there is a nice museum at, at the base today, but that's part of uh, military history of Nevada because they had to fly over Nevada too. Okay, so I counted that. One of my favorite parts of history is at the Tonopah Army Air Base, and of course east of Tonopah, just a few miles. These were hangars, remained for a few years. This has collapsed a couple of years ago, finally. But they've trained pilots and crews for B-24s and P-51 fighter planes during World War II. And I have so much respect for the people that have brought us to where we are today, our servicemen, okay? If it wasn't for them, you know, tell them where we would be today. So this is kind of getting close to the end of my deal here, but it also covers the, the air bases that are, are in, uh, in Nevada today. We have Nellis and we have the Nevada Air Station. They were named after pilots that were killed during World War II, okay? Van Voris was killed in, uh, I'm gonna cheat here and look at this. I can't remember exactly where. Battle of the Bulge, I believe. Anyway, uh, oh no, in the Solomon Islands and uh, Nellis was at the Battle of the Bulge. Anyway, I, th I think we never should forget these people. And uh, I'm gonna read you my my poem in salute to those people and the times and all of the people that came before us and facing the hardships of war and actually Nevada when the crossing came. Okay, this is called Over the Hills I Never Knew. Long ago in Tonopah it grew in a place I never knew. Men were sent there back in 1942 to a valley I never knew. To what they'd see, they had no clue on the flats I never knew. Soon the army base came into view. It was a training place I never knew. Soon above the valleys they flew, high over land I never knew. Many accidents killed pilots and crews crashing into land I never knew. They learned to fight a war that was new in a part of Nevada I never knew. I salute those that flew high in the blue saving America in a war I never knew. Many gave their lives in a war that's true. In my lifetime, freedom is all I never knew. Because they loved our red, white, and blue, I salute all those war heroes I never knew. I've been to the old base a few times since I grew to learn about the history I never knew. When there I think about the pilots and crews giving their lives for me, someone they never knew. I think this kind of winds up the thing here. Uh, now I'd like to see it go out in Nevada, enjoy Nevada, take care of Nevada. And I wanna give you one more little tip here. This is called Lady of the Snows. This is Mount Rose. And this is the Lady of the Snows. As you can use your imagination again, imagination and curiosity is what makes an adventure. Her hair flows this way, okay? Her eye is here. Her nose is here. Her mouth is open to the sky. So when you drive by, look to Mount Rose and see what Nevada is all about. Thank you. This was wonderful, Jerry. This was great. And uh, I loved all the stories. And, and that's what we were talking about. You were talking about your program, you know, um, why? Yeah, why? And that was one of the questions we have. Uh, when did you start thinking about um, uh, working on this first book or actually this is your fourth book well okay wait um i guess i've got a couple questions so that's part of my question but i do have a question for you um when did you start thinking about and working on your first book because now this is your fourth book correct right well my first book called uh, 
diesel smoke over asphalt ribbons. Yeah. And I spent most of my life, well, all my working life in the trucking industry. It's a very misunderstood industry by most people. Most people just hate trucks, but without them, you wouldn't have very much. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to write about the people. Everything is a, to me is about the people. Uh, it's hard. It's a hard industry. Okay. And that was what the book was about, how it, how it started from the, what they call the Teamsters, but these were Teamsters with whips. Okay. Yeah. They didn't drive up to the fuel pump. They fed their animals and stuff. So it starts with those Teamsters and then it goes through some of the experiences I had when I was driving truck and experiences of other people, but it's based on trucking mostly in Nevada and the West. And then my second book, uh, was also about trucking, but it was about trucking companies that I watched grow over the years uh, in the area that I had a lot of respect for. It's called uh, Teamsters, Truckers, and Truck Stops. And it deals with oh, yeah. truck stops like Boomtown, how it was developed, and uh, you know the stories behind those truck stops. And this goes before you know the freeway, and then later as the freeway came through, and how the freeway kind of destroyed a lot of our little towns mm -hmm. a lot and stuff you know because those were first stops but now they're bypassed and then um, so the books. okay <laughs> no no i think that's great so um when you wrote your third book um how long did it take for you to then work on your rhymes book or <laughs> you know you were talking about you know getting your the school neighbor kids uh, you know, homeschooled kids uh, sharing some of the history. You know, how long did that take for you to work on the rhymes? Oh, I don't know, maybe three months or so. I, I'm the kind oh, wow. of a person when I've got something to do, I, I, I don't know, I get, get after it. That's when I retired is when I wrote, you know, started. I still get up at four o'clock in the morning and at four o'clock in the morning, even the TV people are half asleep. You know, so you got to find something to do. And I just started doing a little bit of research and, and I'd taken a lot of pictures over the years when I was driving truck and, and uh, just out in, in, in adventuring in Nevada, which is something I've always liked to do. Although during my life, I've put in a lot of other things, a car thing and all that stuff. But uh, yeah. it's always a love in Nevada that's one out. But I, I, I just want people to understand other people and what they do. If you, if you approach somebody about whether they're wind sailors or, or ballooners, whatever, all you have to do is say, hey, well, how come you do that? Why do you like that? And they'll open up, okay? And, and that's, that's it. I just wanted to explain about truckers. And now, of course, the history of the people, you can't, you can't change history. They tried, but you can't. It is what it is. And the hardships were there for those people and they need to be respected. Absolutely. Um, so we have another question here. Are there arrows like the concrete cement ones you showed um, within the Reno Sparks area? Yeah, there's one north of town out by Mogul. Uh, and you have to go into that uh, housing development on the left there at, at Mogul and work your way back. It's a couple mile hike back there. Oh. Uh, but there's that one that is in a, in a photograph is a Golconda summit but they're about 10 miles or so apart all across Nevada, all across america and there's also some information about the fields they had emergency fields during world war ii in uh in nevada and across the country too for military planes to land at there was one in fernley there was one called uh, humboldt they were called intermediate fields couldn't be used by the public they were only for emergency fields okay and then there's one in buffalo valley and then there's one down uh, uh, south of Goldfield. Wasn't there one also in Elko? Or there's I mean, well, Elko. there's Elko, but I mean, Ely. Is there one in Ely? Is the Intermed? No, I, I don't know. Probably. Okay. But I'm not aware of it. Okay. But uh, okay. But you can still find the runways. You can still see where they were graded. They were graded runways. They weren't paved. But people actually lived there. They had offices and all that sort of stuff. It was kind of there's pictures in the book. Wow. So you said that you worked on your book um, pretty quickly. But is there anything that, as you were putting it together and you know looking at your photos, um, something that you learned that was something new or special um, as you were you know putting together your book that you know you kind of wanted to focus on? 
um, as you were putting this book together and researching? Well, I, I used the other book, you know, kind of as a base for it. Okay. So I didn't really have much except trying to make history rhyme to tell the story of history. If you're a poet, you just kind of write about whatever you want to write about and, and make it rhyme. But if you're trying to hone in on a subject, it, it's, it's kind of tough. Maybe some of them are a little corny. I'll, I'll give people that, you know, because I'm, I'm not a poet. But that was the hardest thing was just trying to go. And then once you write it and then you reread it and you change it and you change it and get it to tell the story with rhymes was kind of <laughs> a little tough at times. I like it though. Um, you have you. Um, somebody saying, uh, thank you, Jerry. This was wonderful. And that they really loved your diesel smoke and asphalt ribbons book as well. So oh, thank is you. there, um, can you tell me you, you know, you, you go out and explore. Are you part of the, the Jeep uh, group or is that something that just you go out and explore with some friends or just yourself or? Well, I used to go out a little more kind of by myself, not, not all that much. You shouldn't really go out there and get very far off of some, no. <laughs> you know, major road, gravel road that's a graded road, like a county road or something. And don't get too far off that you can't walk back out and make sure you take some water, make sure you have, you know, of course, today you have cell phones, but out in Nevada, they're not always working. You know, you don't mm -hmm. always have service. But uh, I don't know, I lost the question. Now, what was, where was I going with this? I don't know. <laughs> but but anyway. with the Jeep, you know, you said you oh, kind of yeah. did some of it yourself or oh, well, the guys, I know yeah. there's Jeep groups. Yeah, yeah, there is. I don't belong to a club. I did the car club thing for years and then I, oh. I'm just not a club guy anymore. But there's a bunch of us old guys that are, you know, let's say around the 80 age group that, that we get together uh, and uh, we're going to do a trip. In fact, uh, starting Sunday, we're going to go down to Tono Pond and spend two or three days. We just get together. It's kind of a hit and miss type of deal. Sometimes we might have two and one time we'll have 10 or whatever. And, and it's, it's just kind of fun. We don't always have a direct destination. I mean, there's plane crashes to search out. In Nevada, there's quite a few of those, uh, and just the canyons. We just there's a road or there's a trail. Let's go up there. You don't always use four wheel drive, uh, but if you see something interesting and you you know you're getting around 80 years old, you're not going to hike awful far. At least we're not. <laughs> you know, so we can drive pretty close most of the time with the jeeps and stuff. So that makes it makes it nice, you know. And we don't we're not like the the guys with the razors and that sort of stuff, they, they go out and look around, but they do it at high speed. We're out to look and see stuff, yeah. you know, so we kind of stop and, <laughs> and, and look at this and, 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 and really enjoy Nevada, you know, that, that's nice. kind of the thing. And it's just searching for whatever, searching for those mysteries. You'll pick up something out there that's worn out. It's just completely worn out. And you wonder what in the world did they do with this thing? You, you, you twist it and turn it and you're thinking, what in the heck did they do? Somebody made it because they didn't go to the hardware store. They didn't have anything. They made stuff. And you just, it's, it's fascinating to think that whatever it was, it's worn out, but you don't know what they did with it. It's, it's, it's the mysteries. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, can you, I know it's a little bit off your book, but I know we've talked about it in the past is, um, can you talk a little bit about how many um, airplane crashes sites have you gone to because i know we know that you know with the wind and you know it um with the drafts that you know so there are a lot of plane crashes that kind of do happen over nevada and we were talking about it several years ago but um you and some buddies have gone out and you know tried to document and explore some of those and i i just think it's a fascinating subject itself well the majority of the, the smaller planes, it, it, it's very hard to to, uh, to find anything, unless they're an old, old site. I mean, they're still all hard to find, but most of the stuff they clean up today, the majority of the were military crashes, okay, and the military cleans up pretty much all of the debris, but so it, it, it's the search, the fun of the hunt, I guess, uh, 
lot of B-24 crashes, especially around Tonopah, because that's where they trained. And, and there was over 100 okay. men killed in, in the years of the base operation. Okay. In fact, we're going to go wow. to the site, I think, on this trip that we're, that's coming up. But probably four or five uh, B-24 crashes, uh, some later model jet crashes, some from Fallon and oh. stuff just and they're scattered everywhere there's they call it the uh nevada triangle it runs from uh, yeah. las vegas you've heard of it then las vegas to uh mm -hmm. reno and then over the mountain to uh fresno bakersfield somewhere down in anyway something yeah yeah and there's a lot of plane crashes but a lot of the small planes crash uh along the sierras uh because of the downdrafts the they get caught oh, in downdraft okay yeah. yeah the downdrafts of the sierras on this side and they're uh in fact uh oh the guy that they look for uh, why, why can't they think of his name so long and th that was what they felt and he took off out of nevada from uh hilton's ranch uh yeah he was a millionaire or something like yeah that. yeah yeah he had a lot yeah. of records and stuff i can't i'm sorry i yeah. can't think of his name i i, I will tomorrow <laughs> anyway <laughs> Yeah, just they felt that he didn't have enough power in the plane, and he got it caught in one of those downdrafts. It was a very small plane, and uh, oh, he's almost had his name. But anyhow, uh, yeah, that's where a lot of them are along there. Of course, they're very hard to get to. There's us Jeep guys can't do it. And besides, you got all those trees. See, and in Nevada, you can get up on a mountaintop and look for, you know, fifty miles. We spotted a lot of sites. You know, debris, you know, with binoculars and stuff across the canyon or something. But it's just the fact that we found, you know, found where it was at, I guess, not actually stepping on the, the exact okay. site, but close enough that we, we called it a find, I guess. You know? <laughs> well, probably no, that's overall, fascinating. Probably 30 or so sites over the years I've been to. Okay. Okay. Well, is there anything else you want to? say to um, the group before we um, head, give it back to the library. Um, well, and thank you again. It was wonderful. Your program was great. So Well, I hope people enjoyed it and I hope they will enjoy Nevada. If you're not able to go out or you don't feel comfortable going out in Nevada, hopefully with my books, it'll at least give you a little insight. I, I feel that people should at least know the lay of the land. When the weatherman's telling you about Ely or, or Elko or Tonopah or whatever, know kind of where it's at maybe what it looks like a little bit maybe you know and understand the people that are out there they're not very big towns we don't have only two big towns three four whatever all together but anyway at one yeah. time we had hundreds of towns you know, they're mostly all gone but yeah. that's it all right i love nevada you love it too take care of it yep thank you that's awesome well thank you washoe county libraries we love um our partnership with you guys and and I hope you guys today um, enjoyed your program, so. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, a special thanks to you, Jerry, Sherry, and uh, Neil Cobb of the Nevada Historical Society. What a great presentation. Uh, a shout out thanks to um, Russell, our library tech, who makes this possible on the, on the backside. And um, thanks for joining us. We'll look forward to seeing you next time. Mm -hmm.